excited to share today bullying prevention and socio-ecological perspective. My contact information is there. This slide will be up at the end as well. If you have any questions or would like to um, further this discussion, I would be happy to do that. Here's a little bit about me. Um, Master of Science from OSU, uh, degree in education, uh, theology degree from ORU here in Tulsa as well. I've been at the Parent Child Center for a number of years. I've been in the field of bullying prevention for about two decades now. Um, also have a number of volunteer uh, roles that I have in the community uh, with Oklahoma PTA and I coach U16 girls soccer so that I should get an award of some kind for working with teens in that capacity, especially coaching soccer. So just an overview, uh, overview of the presentation today. Um, essentially, um, bullying prevention and intervention is just not a school activity. It should be a community um, activity as well, um, from individuals to families to businesses, faith-based organizations, et cetera, and also society as a whole. So this presentation will focus on the work of the Anti-Bullying uh, Collaboration, which is a program of the Parent Child Center of Tulsa and our work in the field of bullying prevention in Northeastern Oklahoma. So where I wanna start though is a most important place. It's the definition of bullying. And um, there are many definitions out there. Our state has a definition in statute. Um, the CDC has a definition. But I also want to bring along the SAMHSA's concept of trauma as well. Um, over the years, this has been a sticking point for students, for parents, for school administrators, for educators, just the notion of what bullying is and how we should move forward with this concept or construct of bullying and who's right. And, and I think that's a, a huge question that, that we're trying to answer today. But along the lines of viewing bullying through a trauma-informed lens is really what I want to get at at the beginning of the presentation today. Um, here's SAMHSA's concept of trauma on the left, you know, has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning. Um, events and circumstances may occur as a single occurrence or repeatedly over time. The individual experience of these events or circumstances help to determine whether it's a traumatic event. A particular event may be experienced as traumatic for one individual, but not for another. Traumatic events by their very nature set up a power differential where one entity has power over another. You know, think about your own experiences growing up in, in school or, or other youth activities you were involved with and this idea or this concept of bullying happened to you. Perhaps you were a victim. Perhaps you saw it happen as a bystander. Um, what do you remember? I mean, if you were victimized, if, if you were in that role, a lot of us can bring those experiences forward in the very present tense. We remember, you know, how we felt. We remember the stress of the situation. We remember how people looked at us in those times. So uh, no matter if it was a repeated event or a one-time event, it was traumatic. And so this notion of trauma and bullying is really the lens that we look uh, at bullying at. Uh, bullying is peer-to-peer -peer abuse. Um, it is traumatic. And the notion of repetitiveness or one-time events is really what we grapple with as a state and as our school districts move forward with policy as well. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. But the CDC's definition of bullying as well is is trauma-informed to an extent. Um, so you see any unwanted aggressive behaviors by another group of youths or uh, who are not siblings or current dating partners. So this notion of horseplay, you know, comes into effect there. This is unwanted aggressive behavior. Kids aren't playing around. There is an imbalance of power, as you'll see in the next bullet point there, whether that's observed or perceived in the situation. It's repeated multiple times or is highly likely to be repeated. Um, bullying may inflict harm or distress on the target of youth, including physical, psychological, and social or educational harm. So when you look at the definition of SAMHSA's concept of trauma and the CDC's definition of bullying, you have a lot of similarities here. You have harm, you have single incidences or repeated incidences that could be considered bullying or trauma. 
but this is really one of the, how I wanted to set the pace today is that the notion of bullying carries trauma with it. It's peer to peer abuse. And that's, that could be new thinking for, for folks as well on the call that bullying is abuse. This behavior is harmful to students um, on a peer to peer level. Now let's take a look at our state definition of bullying. And this is pulled from statute as you can see. Bullying means any pattern of harassment intimidation, threatening behavior, behavior, physical acts, verbal or electronic communication, et cetera. So in the state of Oklahoma, you have to have a pattern when it comes to bullying. And that's really a weakness that we have in our, our own statute right now in Oklahoma. So you have to establish this pattern. Um, students have to present or, or uh, an investigator has to find that this type of behavior has happened repeatedly to a student or group of students for it to be coded as bullying. Um, it, if not, it might be coded as a conflict or not coded, but just simply um, labeled as a conflict um, or even coded as a fight later on. Um, and further, just so you can see that our schools are required to investigate bullying, um, you can see in our statute that policy must name an individual to investigate bullying. Um, they must document and verify that bullying um, has occurred and also the parents of the perpetrator or the person who's being abused must be notified after the fact. And so this is all information that happens afterward when a bullying investigation has been conducted. And if you want to really uh, keep it to the letter of the law after it's been verified and documented. So if, if a bullying investigation moves forward um, and they do not find bullying, uh, according to our statute, the parents do not have to be contacted regarding the outcome or even that a report has been filed. So the way I see it is Oklahoma has some definition issues. The first one, bullying is limited, it's not limited to a single incident but must be repetitive behavior. Um, it's common for students to have to endure being bullied until a threshold of pattern has been met, after which intervention strategies are initiated. And on more than one occasion, I've heard, you know, uh, students and parents and others tell me that it has to be measured by three. It has to happen three times before an intervention strategy can be moved forward regarding intervention and prevention methods. Um, and so a child has to endure that behavior in, in many uh, instances. There's no provision for power imbalances as well. Uh, a person is either a bully or a victim in Oklahoma's definition. Um, uh, Dan Oveas, who is really kind of the father of bullying prevention from Norway, he has the, the bully victim concept where a person can be both bully and victim or victim and bully, but within our state statute, uh, you have to be one or the other. And so it makes it for interesting for interventions. Uh, next, they're under two. If a victim chooses to behave aggressively, physically or verbally toward the bully, it is likely to be coded as a fight, even if the target has less power and has no real control over the outcome of the situation. So the moment that you show some type of um, aggression toward a person who is picking on you or bullying you or abusing you, even if, even if the power that you have is less likely to determine a positive outcome for you, you know, it's likely that that might be coded as a fight. It might not be looked at as a bullying situation because we have no provision for power imbalances. And lastly, our definition is not trauma-informed in the state of Oklahoma uh, because uh, the person who is victimized, if they have this idea that they have been bullied, ultimately it's up to someone else to investigate that and to make that determination. Now, I'm all for schools investigating and setting uh, a course of intervention and prevention strategies. Um, you know, I, being in this field for 20 years, this whole word bullying has been such a problematic notion because these definitions are so narrow and our legislation, you know, really kind of pigeonholes this into a particular definition. So it's either is or it isn't. So sometimes I wonder if we just get rid of this word altogether and talk about trauma and intervention and prevention 
strategies when it comes to bullying and peer-to-peer -peer abuse or school-based trauma, how much more progress we could have regarding, you know, the safety and well-being of our, our students while at school. So those are the definition issues as I see it. Here's some recommendations uh, regarding policy and uh, practice. So align our, our state definition with the CDC's definition of bullying to include single incidences that are highly likely to be repeated. Now with this, because of our state statute, that administrator at school would still be the person who would determine if bullying actually happened. So that still gives power to schools to make that decision. Also include power imbalances, the attempt by the perpetrator to exert control over the target use behavior or to limit the victim's ability to respond or stop their aggression. Now this is specifically from the CDC as well. And so you can see the practice recommendations there. Um, under number one, understand bullying via a trauma-informed lens, understand the short-term and long-term outcomes that are similar to ACEs. Now, I don't have time in this um, presentation to go into that, but there's a body of research, research out there that shows that the um, outcomes are similar regarding stress, prolonged stress, um, and health outcomes related to bullying as well. Um, we are well versed in the short term outcomes related to victimization regarding academic progress, um, depression, anxiety, mental health issues, et cetera. Um, but those long term outcomes more, uh, that's a whole, uh, it can be a new body of research that's available, but that are similar to ACEs. And I have that at the end of the presentation just as a sample. Um, the individual determines if the event is traumatic, not the investigator. Um, one person may experience trauma while another may not in similar experiences. You know, this, this is always the, that dual role of how come you can't behave like someone else? You know, someone else has had the same experience. It made them tougher, you know, that toughened them up. How come you can't be like that other kid? But you know what? Uh, not everybody experiences trauma in the same way. Not everybody has the same resiliency. Um, not everybody has the same problem solving skills in those situations. Um, also, the last bullet point there, parents will experience trauma alongside their children during bullying or other school based incidents associated with violence or abuse. And, you know, uh, what Gall mentioned earlier, we do have a partnership with Haru USA regarding a uh, a social simulation there at uh, OU Tulsa regarding bullying investigations where we have administrators and educators who investigate incidents of bullying. Uh, they have, they sit through two lectures. One is based that I give on bullying as trauma and another one is on adverse childhood experiences. So that's the first part of the day. But the second part of the day is working with actors uh, in pre-written scenarios regarding, you know, bullying at school. And often there's a parent actor with a, with a teen actor as well. And I know administrators and counselors on this call and others can tell you that, you know, when parents arrive at school, they're angry. They are not thinking clearly at times because they're responding to the stress of a traumatic situation. So we know that the parents are experiencing trauma as well and they just want their child to be safe, but oftentimes those discussions don't move forward very cordially. So these are the policy and practice recommendations and we'll talk about what we're doing to move those forward here in Oklahoma in just a bit as well. I did wanna give you some data. Um, I know a lot of you on the call are, are familiar with the Oklahoma Youth Risk Behavior Survey. I saw Tosin Akande early. It's great to see you, who's with the Department of Ed and who used to be with the Department of Health. Um, but this data on the left side of your screen shows data from 13 to 2017. Youth Risk Behavior Survey is done every other year via random selection of school sites with high school students grade 9 through 12. And according to high schoolers in the state of Oklahoma, between 13 and 17, you've seen a significant increase of students who believe they've been bullied while at school at least once in the past 30 days. So this is totally student perception in what's happening. 
On the right side, you see data from the Department of Education and the annual school incidents report. Every school uh, district in the state of Oklahoma is required to report up to the Department of Education regarding bullying, bullying without physical injury, bullying with physical injury, fights with physical injury, without physical injury, um, and just a merit of other uh, behavioral um, elements of, of violence while at school uh, perpetrated youth to youth. So even aggravated assault is contained within this annual report. But you'll notice regarding the same time period that you see a decrease in uh, bullying verified and documented. I'll use that those terms verified and documented incidents of bullying while at school. So in 13, 14, you know, 1,089, in 17, 18, 866. And so the data clearly shows a gap. Um, you know, there are all types of reasons for this. You know, when you think about high schoolers, are they reaching out uh, for help to their teachers and administrators, um, or are they just moving forward in, in taking the abuse um, because of the many messages that we've that we teach our kids in society today toughen up this is just a part of, of adolescence and development you know I, I was bullied when i was a kid and i survived those sorts of messages that just really do not help or perhaps these students have reached out to, for help before and the type of help that they've received was inadequate and so with each you know each time they reach out, the likelihood that they reach out again because of, of an inadequate response really kind of is a barrier for them to asking for help subsequently. And so this is data that I, that I like to point out regarding Oklahoma and what our youth are saying and what our schools have found. But even a report uh, on the Department of Ed site, you can find that information uh, under school performance. Um, before I used to have to submit an open record request, but now it's all there so anyone can see it. I did want to show a little bit more trend data from Oklahoma just to, to uh, get it out there um, regarding violence as well. The first one is pretty important here, percentage of students who did not go to school on one or more days because they felt they would uh, be unsafe at or on the way to school. You know, it's significantly increased from 2009 to 19. Um, also, there's some sexual behavior there as well. Even rape is included. So this is the type of information that I look at all the time um, for two decades, rather. And so it's kind of the fuel that moves me forward in the work of intervention and prevention. And then under bullying as well, you can see in 2009 and then 2019, you have a significant increase from 17.5% to 19.4%. Also, electronic bullying as well. <laughs> we see that you know we're at about 14.5 percent in this area even the mental health piece though uh, in this time where we're focused on you know hope informed strategies with the work of dr chan hillman and uh, what he's done in our state and across the nation this is exceedingly important percentage of students who ever felt so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that they stopped doing some usual activities. So when you see, when I see 38.6%, you know, that's just a, a percentage, but I see tens of thousands of kids, of students in our state who said, you know what, I've had this sadness or hopelessness to such a degree that I'm stopping doing the normal things that I do. And we really need to take, you know, note of this and uh, this should inform our practices as well, how we work with students and also percentage of students who seriously considered attempting suicide. You can see that the number has significantly increased from 2009 to 2019. So that, that kind of sets the stage for the definition of bullying, uh, looking at bullying via trauma-informed lens, understanding that this is peer-to-peer -peer abuse, looking at the state of Oklahoma's definition, knowing that there is no room for single incidences that are highly likely to be repeated. Um, there's no uh, talk of power imbalances, et cetera, regarding the bully victim dynamic. Uh, this sets the stage. So now what I wanna get into uh, is the portion regarding the anti-bullying collaboration uh, in our socio-ecological model that we've been following since 2012, SAMHSA's theory of practice. 
Um, many of you are aware of our work and have been part of our work since 2012 and uh, have even been uh, during our, our, our 2012 conference call or, or press release to announce the collaboration. We're part of that as well. But our mission is to promote a safe, civil, and respectful community by preventing bullying among children, youth, and adults. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, we've really keyed into the children and youth part. The adults has become more elusive because our, our work is really keyed in with uh, the community in that socio-ecological model um, regarding, you know, parents and teachers and, and students. Um, we've had some great philanthropic support. The Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation has been with us from the beginning. Um, our great friend and partner, Randy Cherney as well, has been part of the work. And uh, definitely without the support of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, we would not be where we are today. Also the Anna and Henry Zare Foundation and the Sanford and Irene Bernstein Foundation. Our past philanthropic supporters include the Tulsa Area United Way, through their community investments um, initiative and the Doris Kaiser Family Foundation. And you can see our 25 cross-sector partners there cover a wide range of community partners. A lot of them are education-based um, from local districts here in Tulsa County to um, uh, prevention agencies as well, the health department, local men's for equality, uh, the PTA, et cetera, just to list a few. But we've had a great partnership base. Um, we meet once a month here at the Parent Child Center. So more about that in just a little bit. Um, here is our motivation for being drawn together or for convening in 2012, the documentary Bully. Uh, perhaps you've, you've watched that uh, documentary by Lee Hirsch. If you haven't, I really encourage you to do that because it is really a vivid look at bullying and youth um, in the United States and more interestingly in Oklahoma. Um, before this film was set to release, I knew at the time that two of the families of the five in the film were from Oklahoma. So you have Laura and Kirk Smalley who've become great friends to me, Kelby Johnson as well. Those two, um, <coughs> those three folks were from Oklahoma before the movie was set to release. However, the Libbies also moved to Oklahoma. They're from Sioux City, Iowa, um, and they moved here to be closer to the Smallies. So in essence, three of the five families being from Oklahoma really was the convening power here just to have that, that conversation with community stakeholders. You know, this, this film's getting ready to release. You know, what does that say about Oklahoma? What does that say about our prevention strategies that we've, you know, been utilizing all of these years, what can we do to move succinctly throughout the state to provide better, you know, prevention and intervention policy, et cetera. So that's really the, the launching point. <laughs> and also, thankfully, the, uh, <clears throat> the Schutzman Family Foundation did bring the director of the film, Lee Hirsch, in as well in June, and we had a special viewing at Circle Cinema. The mayor was there, we had a panel, the Libbies were there as well, um, and it also was subsequently viewed with Teach for America teachers too. So that was really the, the convening power behind the anti-bullying collaboration and moving forward. Um, we had some significant milestones in the beginning as well. Um, so we announced our former, uh, initiative as a collective impact initiative on August 10th, 2012. Um, we've had some great support from our uh, local media too. Many of you remember Russ McCaskey, <coughs> Russ McCaskey, who was here for a number of years with Channel 2. We partnered right away and we had a 30 minute primetime live special in the fall of 2012 regarding bullying prevention and intervention and those those folks there on the panel where Russ, get, Russ is, um, they were from TPS administrators. We have a community activist there and we have a local therapist. But we had a number of, of uh, therapists that were answering calls from the community during that live event. We uh, advocated for House Bill 1661 as well, wrote language for that bill. Ultimately, it was a mandatory annual training for school staff regarding bullying prevention and intervention practices. Um, and we worked with the Department of Education to develop that training during the summer of 2013. <clears throat> we had a, a kickoff 
with the Department of Ed and we actually did a training in five regions in Oklahoma and we did a, a webinar as well that lived on the department's website for a couple of years. So those are our significant milestones as we move forward with the work of the collaboration. Now getting into this SAMHSA social ecological model, I know a lot of you are familiar with this already, but really the notion that bullying or this type of behavior does not exist in a vacuum is really where we're launching from here now. There are many involved, the individual, their relationships, the community, and societal um, influences are all operating and influenced by each level as well and supported or not supported to a large degree by this model. <clears throat> so breaking into it a little deeper here, bullying prevention and intervention should be addressed at all levels. So with the individual, um, you know, we'll get into it here in just a minute. Let me take a look at time. Okay, we're good. Um, just the notion of, of an inability to relieve stress and having a bad day. I mean, something as obvious and simple, but as complex as that, you know, often is the point at which people mistreat others. I mean, think about the last time you had a really stressful day. You know, how did you treat those closest to you? How did you treat your coworkers? You know, um, did you recognize that you were possibly mistre mistreating those around you? And what was your response after you were, you know, either confronted or realized that, hey, I may have mistreated a, a, a loved one or a colleague or someone in the community? How did you move forward with that? So this whole notion of the individual, you know, speaks volumes in relationships, you know. Um, when I think about bullying uh, prevention strategy, strategies and intervention strategies, you know, you have to think about the family core. You know, what is the, what is the um, belief about bullying and how we treat others? You know, um, working with families and students in schools for 20 years, you see a lot of different family norms about how you move forward with responding to, you know, violence um, with bullying and you know, personally, um, growing up in a family where you didn't take that sort of thing. I remember, you know, seeing just many incidences where, you know, even as kids, we were encouraged to go to the next step, you know, fight and do that sort of thing if somebody picks on you. But, you know, so many families live in that space and that's their norm. Well, hey, you don't let people pick on you. You're going to go and take care of this and come home. And that's how we do it. So the notion of family um, and community, et cetera. So I'm going to move forward through here kind of quickly so I can uh, share how we've moved forward as an anti-bullying collaboration to address these areas. Um, so here's, here's really what our model looks like. So at the societal, societal level, we've had a lot of uh, hand in policy development at the state and local level as well. We've had a, a strong TV media presence here in Tulsa. We're blessed with that. We have 25 cross-sector partners. We meet once per month. Um, you can visit our website at preventbullyingtulsa.org. We regularly have conferences, workshops, and also we partner with different uh, athletic events. Um, uh, Tulsa Drillers has been great here for a number of years. We've partnered with those folks to do an anti-bullying day at, you know, One Oak alongside with Tulsa Health Department and our our partners as well. Lots of professional development, parent education, social emotional learning and bullying prevention programming. So obviously um, with the community uh, portion, a lot of our partnership is with schools and parent groups and other nonprofits here in Tulsa. Um, it's easily convened. Also on the relationship level, you know, we've worked hard to really convey to this, this notion of social emotional learning competency building for students and adults and more recently brain-based interventions, you know, with um, based on uh, great researchers and scientists like Dr. Bruce Perry and others. Um, also on that individual level, fostering one-on-one -on -one re relationships based on empathy and support. We also provided quite a bit of technical assistance to not legal advice though, I have to say that for uh, individuals seeking help and reporting and, and what the next steps are. So that's kind of what our, that is what our model looks like. And so I'll move through and share about some of those things that we have going on right now. Um, 
we're still in this in this space of um, advocacy, legislative advocacy. Uh, I know it's been a difficult session, as we all know. Um, currently, you know, the discussion has been on the budget in Oklahoma and getting past our 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 downfall here with appropriations, but we have moved a bill forward out of the Senate and it's in the House right now and we're working to get that this bill heard before this session ends even during this time right now when things are, are closing fast. Um, so here's what we'd like what we've been working with with Senator Sharp and Representative Kerb uh, in the House and it's in the House like I said so we, we'd like to see our definition change and align with that of the CDC so instead of bullying means any pattern, we'd like to see that scratched in aligning with the CDC. Bullying means any unwanted aggressive behavior committed in person or by electronic communication, et cetera. That involves a power imbalance and is repeated or is highly likely to be repeated. That way we have this notion of single incidences that could be considered bullying and also um, that power imbalance where um, truly one person has more power than the other to control the outcome and to limit, you know, the victim's ability to, to get help for themselves. Next, um, there's an important piece about parent notification uh, requirement for notifying, for notification to the parents or legal guardians of the reported victim of bullying and the parents or legal guardian of the reported perpetrator of bullying within 24 hours um, of the recipient of the report of bullying. So this notion of having parent notification before, you know, the investigation starts, there's a report of bullying. Now as an administrator, I'm required to notify both sets of parents or guardians to let them know what's going on and not after the fact. And this is a fairly quick Turn around within 24 hours. Also, in the, uh, here's another piece too. Um, if a student expresses suicidal thoughts or intentions or encourages another student to commit suicide, the parents or legal guardians of the student shall be notified immediately. So, and when we're thinking especially about distance learning as well and district owned devices and how. Uh, what type of monitoring software that districts are using regarding uh, Chromebooks, et cetera. You know, this would speak to that. Or even if, if a student did a search online uh, regarding, you know, suicide or harming themselves or, or even threatening another student. So that applies to virtual space or digital space, but it also applies to face-to-face -face as well. I'm just thinking back to the, the data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey regarding those students who would consider suicide. This is, is fitting for parent notification. So that is our uh, current focus, legislative focus. Um, also, we really maintain a positive connection with the media at this point too and have for, for a year since 2012. Um, you'll see that uh, we've worked with KJRH Channel 2 and Channel 8 regarding cyberbullying and cyber safety during uh, distance learning. And the main concern here is that, um, as you know, students are at home, possibly with more unsupervised time online. So they possibly are exploring more, interacting with other students, uh, friends, uh, people they know, perhaps people they do not know as well. And so we're looking for a possible increase in cyberbullying and a possible increase in safety issues regarding interacting with the unknown other is what we call that, you know. Um, and this is an important piece too uh, regarding parent supervision. You know, as a parent of high schoolers, I remember when our, our kids were younger, you know, it was really easy and tempting just to hand them a, de a device to, you know, just as a distraction, you know, as something to do, but really it's the most, one of the most powerful tools we could give our, our children. And so what's on our device, what's on our phone, what's our social media look like? you know, what can they actually access with that? So we're really kind of advising parents at this point too to create those family and social norms regarding um, what their children can and cannot access online during this time. It's a great, great point. I was asked by um, Keith Taylor there at the, at the bottom center, you know, what, 
when should parents start having these conversations, you know, about family norms and expectations regarding cyberspace? And I said, as soon as you hand them a device that can get them online, you know, if, if you're putting that device in the hand of your child, you should have uh, norms and practices as a family already, already, you know, discussed and already in place once that device is in that child's hand. Um, we did have a great partnership as well with Channel 8 uh, in our Bullying is Not Okay, um, Bullying is Not Okay campaign two years ago, and that still lives on their website as well. There's a number of videos there that can be viewed or downloaded, and uh, so it was a great. And I just have Laura Fulbright up there because she talked about us a few times, so. So moving forward as well, um, and as mentioned earlier too, regarding uh, school-owned devices and distance learning, you know, if there's an increased risk of cyberbullying and cyber safety issues due to students spending more time online, perhaps unsupervised, you know, schools are likely responsible for intervention in cyber when cyberbullying happens via district-owned device. And I have the word likely there too because we're in a real gray area. I feel right now, you know, if it's during a, a class if it is during a, a Zoom call with a group of students or even a small, a small chat, you know, and cyberbullying happens there, something that compromises safety, obviously, yeah, absolutely. But if a student is using that device on their own time, you know, in their room unsupervised, you know, what is the responsibility of the school in that situation? I think it's, it's a great area. Um, but I would say that schools are likely responsible. However, I think a lot of our districts who do have one-to-one -one capacity among students are responsible, you know, and they have monitoring software such as GoGuardian and Beacon or Securely to monitor uh, student online activity. Uh, Beacon is a product of GoGuardian and that particularly is used regarding uh, suicide prevention. And so um, I would ask, you know, if you're involved with the school, you know, what type of software, if you have monitoring software for your one-to-one -one devices. And even as a parent, I would have that conversation too regarding, you know, cyber safety and, and digitally owned devices and student activity online and what you can expect. I know as a parent, we get uh, reports every week regarding our, our children's online behavior, you know, sites that they've gone to, if there's been any restrictions, et cetera. So we have access to that information, so. Next, I do want to focus here just for a minute on our website as well, uh, preventbullyingtulsa.org, and I do want to key in on our educators link for just a second. Um, if our partners have any type of uh, prevention programming, bullying prevention, violence prevention, etc., you can access their programs from this link or under the educators tab, and that will take you directly to the program resource that the partner offers. And oftentimes these are um, services and programs that cost nothing to schools, individuals, et cetera. So I do wanna highlight that as well. And also just the idea toward the bottom center, the resources from the Department of Education, they really have developed a great panel of resources there, especially regarding reporting, you know, what parents can do, what administrators and teachers can do regarding documentation, um, documenting those incidents of, of alleged bullying. And so I, I always encourage folks, you know, go, go to the Department of Ed's website, go to our website, look for the forms um, because those forms are really important. I've heard on a number of occasions when parents seek transfers from one district to another, that if a, if a uh, district cannot provide the documentation to a, a potential transferring district, it's the transferring district and they do not have to accept that transfer request. And so it's exceedingly important that things are documented well. And like I said, the Department of Ed has a great uh, number of forms for anyone to use. Also, um, here's our reporting site as well, our tab rather. You can see that our partner schools there can click, uh, an individual can click right to their link and take them to the reporting page. Here's Broken Arrows for instance, but we have Broken Arrow, Jinx Tulsa Union, et cetera. We also have an Oklahoma Security Institute tip line report as well. 
and this is a reporting feature for any school in the state of Oklahoma. So a, a, a parent, a student, a teacher, anyone can make a report there regarding bullying, gang violence, suicidal behavior. It's also important to know that this is a, a department of the Office of Oklahoma Homeland Security as well. Lastly, we have the uh, Office for Civil Rights report link. Um, and again, we, we're limited on time, but when bullying and civil rights become an issue, um, it behooves districts and schools to, as you know, to create a plan to address the issue. Um, it's not just enough it's a civil, if it's a civil rights issue to address the issue under the school's anti-bullying policy. Um, there are specific requirements for from the OCR that you're looking to demonstrate if you are a school site or district to demonstrate that you have work to prevent and intervene in those situations. Um, and here are the titles that you need to be aware of, Title VI, Title IX, and Title II regarding uh, these protected areas. Um, so often, um, when I speak with, with students and parents, you know, the discussion is, well, do you believe that these types of incidents are based on any of these title pieces, race, sex, disability, et cetera? And if they are, it, it, it really calls for a different type of reporting mechanism, which is here at the office, uh, U.S. Department of Education. So um, real quick, uh, community here's our, our community focus highlight we do some notable conferences as well we've had mark brackett in twice from yale center for emotional intelligence dr tracy viancourt as well university of ottawa her research bullying gets under your skin is is worth the read and really is associated with those aces and the life course type of outcomes gary ruddick who a lot of us know regarding his uh, police work here in tulsa tulsa public schools and other parts of the community is now with Oklahoma School Security Institute is protecting our future regarding school shootings. We've had that a number, a number of times. Chris Harris Jr., who used to be a Denver Broncos, one of my favorites. You can see that's the large picture um, with 200 youth that we have worked with regarding bullying prevention for years in the past and our anti-bullying day at the drillers. These things will move forward as well this fall. We'll be working this summer to bring professional development uh, forward for teachers and parents so be on the lookout for that this is something we do regularly and also just to talk about our current relational individual focus highlights um, a lot of us are familiar with dr perry's three r's uh, reaching the learning brain in the notion of top up versus bottom down um, you have this idea that individuals under stress uh, really students under stress, prolonged stress, toxic stress, um, students who are having um, some sort of, of crisis in the classroom, you know, what is our best approach? Is it to reason with them first, regulate, uh, relate or regulate, or is it to regulate, relate or reason? Um, so think about the idea of you're in a stressful situation, you're driving to work, you're late, for a presentation, you're in a traffic jam on the highway in the Tulsa area, it's the Broken Air Expressway, and you are just really amped up and nothing's going right, traffic is going slow, and think about in that scenario, having your, your junior um, math teacher pop into your head and try to teach you new equations. I mean, this idea that learning doesn't happen uh, in stressful, High stress situations is really where Dr. Bruce Perry is coming from. And I think we've seen that in motion. So the notion that you move up from the bottom up to regulate, relate, reason is how you work with children and adults moving forward. And then the idea many of us are familiar with is the castle model on SEL, the notion of self-awareness, social uh, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills building, and responsible decision making. These are, these are the skills that we're moving forward with right now regarding really what we do in education, uh, with parents, with teachers, with students. Uh, 
really to address that uh, need to relieve stress and, and regulate emotions. So I know that I'm about out of time. I've, I, it's 1148 and so I did want to highlight a few of the programs that we offer as well at the Parent Child Center. Safe Passage we've already talked about but also Teach Kindness. I think I have a copyright issue so my picture isn't coming up there. So that's another free program that we've partnered with the National Outfit um, regarding a pre-K-8 curriculum regarding kindness. Uh, that is a one month challenge and it, it does extend throughout the school year, but we've worked really vigorously here in Tulsa County to get that off the ground. Our Kids on the Block puppet program, which is off at the Parent Child Center for elementary age kids has gone virtual, by the way. You can actually see those puppet shows online right now for those of you that are familiar, and of course our anti-bullying collaboration. So 